Now, this next lecture, to me, it's even worse than the previous one because it's so sad to see what is happening. So before we start this one, we must ask the Lord again to be with us in a special way, lest we become presumptuous. Our loving Heavenly Father, once again we ask for your divine help and for your angels. And Lord, this is a long session tonight and people's minds are tired. My own is also tired. So I pray that you will help us to understand and that you will enlighten our minds and give us the right speech and the right thoughts. Because Lord, this is not only going into this meeting here, but is going onto these tapes and might even go out to the whole world via the internet. And we do not want stumbling and fumbling along so that we make an impression that would bring on dishonor to your name. So be with us tonight, Lord, and help us through the second session as well, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Gathering the children. I am and there is none beside me. I will never be a widow or suffer loss of children. Isaiah 47 verse 8. A prediction of the universal church system that says it will be the ultimate. I sit as queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn, Revelation 18.7. Talking about the system, the woman that rides the beast, the church that controls the political entity, the Roman, new Roman Empire, which circumvents the entire globe. Revelation 17 verse 5 calls this woman the mother of prostitutes. Now if the mother is a prostitute, being unfaithful to God, then uh, the children must also be prostitutes if the Bible calls her the mother of prostitutes. And we'll find that Roman Catholicism controls all the religions of the world and has almost total control over Christianity. Fortunately, only almost. This drives the devil nuts. There she is, St. John's Lateran, the system, the church where she speaks ex cathedra. She claims that uh, she is the Mater Ecclesia, the mother of all the churches. And all the churches are subject to her. And if the churches are subject to her, then they are subject to the high priest of Lucifer. Let's ask them whether that is so. This is the latest catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. It is the authoritative document sanctioned by Pope John Paul II. They must know. Article 3. The Church, Mother and Teacher. It is in the Church, in communion with all the baptized, that the Christian fulfills his vocation. From the Church he receives the Word of God containing the teachings of the law of Christ. From the church he receives the grace of the sacraments to, that sustain him on the way. And from the church he learns the example of holiness and recognizes its model and source in the all-holy Virgin Mary. Oops. So the church teaches us that the model of all perfection is the Virgin Mary. That's very interesting. That is, as we have seen, the acronym for the female form of divinity, which by the admission of Alice A. Bailey was none other than Lucifer himself. Is that correct? Do you remember that from the previous lecture? Okay. So, that's very interesting. So there we have a problem already. The moral life and spiritual worship, we present our bodies as living sacrifices within the body of Christ that we form and in communing with the offering of His Eucharist. So the Eucharist becomes central. Definition of incredulity, 
heresy, apostasy, and schism. Let's get it from the horse's mouth, Catechism of the Catholic Church. There is no graver offense than heresy. And therefore it must be rooted out with fire and the sword. That was what the Catholic Encyclopedia said in 1911. Let me tell you something interesting. Rome never changes. Maybe she hides it for a while, but she never changes. Here's a definition, Catholic Catechism, Article 2089. Incredulity is the neglect of a revealed truth or the willful refusal to assent to it. Heresy is the obstinate post-baptismal denial of some truth which must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. So if you refuse to believe something that the Catholic Church teaches, then you are a what? A heretic. And then apostasy is the total repudiation of the Christian faith, and schism is the refusal of submission to the Roman Pontiff. Have you got the definition from the horse's mouth now? So, schism is the refusal of submission to the Roman Pontiff or of communion with the members of the church subject to him. If you want nothing to do with Rome, then you are in schism, and you, if you don't believe her, then you are a heretic. Well, I proudly stand before you as both today. Amen. Thank you. Romanism and the Reformation. Wycliffe, Jerome, Luther, Knox, all of these great reformers, they said that Rome was the Antichrist. There's the quote, we don't have to read it all. What is the Roman Catholic Protestant controversy all about? It's about doctrine. That's what it's about. That's why Lucifer says in the form of his Matreya, forget about the scriptures and your argument about scriptures. It's wasteful energy. Didn't you say that? Well, the foreword of the old King James Bible refers to the papacy as the man of sin and warns against malignment from what it calls popish persons. They called a spade a spade. And the Douay version, which is the Roman Catholic version, countered with the following. This is the Catholics now answering that. They say all Protestant clergy are thieves, murderers, and ministers of the devil. They didn't like each other. Do you notice that? They didn't like each other. Now why didn't they like each other? Protestantism, this is the Western Watchman, Roman Catholic Journal. Protestantism, the murderous hag, is slowly dying from corruption and congenital rottenness, and she will not much longer encumber the earth. They wrote that in 1914. So the Reformation was dying down because of something called the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation put doctrines back into Protestantism, which took the heat of Catholicism so that the Catholic Church could no longer be the Antichrist, but that Antiochus Epiphanes for a miserable little Greek king, he became the Antichrist, or the super one is coming in the future, when the real one is already here. And all the reformers believed that. But Protestantism, according to Catholicism, the murderous hag was dying of rottenness. Protestantism is not a religion, never was a religion. The most that could be said of it was that it was a form of rape and robbery masquerading as a religion. That's what the Western Watchman wrote in 1914. This is a Catholic source. So there was no love lost between the two. The Jesuit order was founded on August 15, 1534 by Ignatius Loyola in order to counteract Protestantism. Its general ruled as absolute monarch in all parts of the world and the different kingdoms of Europe, Asia, Africa, America laid its feet divided into provinces. They were to obey perit a cadaver, like a corpse. No mind of your own. This is totally unbiblical. And they had to obey their master absolutely. Loyola taught that even if God gave you an animal without sense as a master, you will not hesitate to obey him as master and guide because God ordained it to be so. That's very nice. Now the Council of Trent was called to meet the crisis of Protestantism. And in fact, Protestant representatives were present at the Council of Trent. It was called by Pope Paul III between 1545 and 1563, met in three sessions, and during one of those sessions, Protestants were present. But this council reaffirmed every single doctrine 
disputed by Protestants. Transubstantiation, that the bread becomes the literal body of Christ. Justification by faith and works was repudiated by Protestantism. The medieval mass was upheld with its pagan incrustations. The seven sacraments were confirmed. Salvation is gained through sacramental systems. And there's grace in the sacrament. Hello, there's grace in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Celeb celibacy was maintained. The doctrine of purgatory was maintained. Indulgences were reaffirmed. And if you think indulgences are dead, I have news for you. Pope John Paul II, the present Pope, issued indulgences. It nearly caused a major rift and the Lutheran Church nearly got a hiccup over the ecumenical movement as a consequence. But it was only a hiccup. The papal power was increased by giving the Pope the authority to enforce decrees of the Council and requiring church officials to promise him obedience. That comes from the history of Christianity, a very reputable source. That was the reason for the Reformation and every single one was confirmed at the Council of Trent. What does transubstantiation teach? Eucharist meditations, page 111, Roman Catholic source, marvelous dignity of the priests in their hand as in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Son of God becomes incarnate. Behold the power of the priest, the tongue of the priest makes God from a morsel of bread. It is more than creating the world. Well, that's what it teaches. Canon 1, notice this, Council of Trent, session 13. If anyone denies that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, but says that he is in it only as a sign or a figure or a force, let him be an anathema. I'm glad to be an anathema. Amen. Because Hebrews 10.14 says, Because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. And I prefer to believe my Bible and to trust in my Jesus who paid the price at the cross. Forgiveness of sins, you remember that one? Who can forgive sins except God alone? The priest has the power of the keys, the power of delivering sinners from hell and of making them worthy of paradise and of changing them from slaves of Satan into children of God. And God himself is obligated to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon. Catholic source. So in other words, we have a major problem here. And then we have this even bigger problem of Mary as mediatrix. In 1854, Pope Pius declared her immaculate. That means without sin. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it says that Mary was born under the law which means she was born under the condemnation of the law. She was like anyone else. 1951, Pope Pius XII defined and enforced the doctrine of the bodily assumption of Mary. And Catholic layman writes the following, The sinner that ventures directly to Christ comes with dread and apprehension of his wrath. But let him only employ the mediation of the Virgin with her son, and she has only to show that son the breasts that gave him suck, and his wrath will immediately be appeased. That's pretty sick, don't you think? Wow! Imagine a mother doing that. And the wrath is appeased, his eyes will fall out. No, that's nonsense. Now here Dave Hunt, Woman Rides the Beast, page 438, quotes the statements of the various saints regarding Mary. He falls and he is lost who has not recourse to Mary. Mary is called the gate of heaven because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. That's exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. Now remember that Alice A. Bailey told us that the female form of this divinity is Lucifer in his androgenic form. So, the way to salvation is open to none other than through Mary. Sorry, the Bible says the opposite. The salvation of all depends on their being favored and protected by Mary. He who is protected by Mary will be saved. He who is not will be lost. Our salvation depends on thee. God will not save us without the intercession of Mary. That's not biblical. So, here in Ephesus, you can go to this place, which is an avowed fake. Everybody knows it. Even the tabloids, visionary accounts of believers to the chapel of Ephesus, Turkey, were f proven forgeries. Yet Rome says this is where Mary lived. Now, here Rome says Mary lived here and she ascended into heaven. But if you belong to the Orthodox Church, 
You can go to Jerusalem and you can go to the grave of Mary. It's pretty confusing, eh? The one religion has a grave site there and the other one says there is no, no grave. Pope Pius defined and enforced the doctrine of the bodily assumption of Mary. So by 1950, we had a goddess in heaven. Now, all who die in grace and friendship, this is the Catholic Catechism, the present one. So nobody can be confused here. The Church gives the name Purgatory to the final purification. That's based on the tradition of the Church. As for lesser faults, we must believe that before the final judgment there is a purifying fire. He, who puts his, who, he whose truth says that whoever asks this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor in the age to come. From this sentence we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age, but certain in the age to come. Interesting. So purgatory is alive and well. Have any of these doctrines been changed by Rome? No. Let's ask uh, the spokesman for the Catholic Church, Bonaventure Henwood, more answers to your questions, traditions, infallibility and scripture. What has he got to say? It follows from what has been said that the Church does not draw its knowledge of all that God has revealed from the Holy Scriptures. Tradition and scripture. Secondly, the unbreakable bond between scripture and tradition accounts for the fact that Catholics, that for Catholics, Tradition is the context in which the scriptures are to be interpreted. So which is higher, tradition or the Bible? Tradition. So nothing has changed there either. The Bible. It used to belong to a prohibited books. The early church of Antioch used the Syrian Bible. Hebrew and text is older than the um, Masoretic text. The Valdensis has had access to those original writings. And the Turks captured Constantinople. Greek scholars brought their manuscripts to the West. So the Septuagint was made for the Alexandria Library. That's a problem. That's a problem. The Apocrypha, the hidden books. The Council of Trent in 1546 said, Whoever shall not receive as sacred and canonical all these books and every part of them, as they are commonly read in the Catholic Church and are contained in the old Vulgate Latin edition, or shall knowingly and deliberately despise the aforesaid traditions, let him be accursed. Council of Trent. I stand accursed again. I don't know what to do with all the curses anymore. <laughs> Let's see what it teaches. The Apocrypha, bewitching odd. Tobias chapter 6 verse 4 to 8, quoting the Apocrypha. Open the fish, Take the heart and the liver and the gall. If a devil or an evil spirit will trouble any, we may make smoke thereof before the man or the woman, and the party shall no longer be vexed. As for the gall, it is good to anoint a man that has witness in his eyes, it's old English, and he shall be healed. Okay, so the gallbladder of a fish is good for driving out demons. That's what Tobias says. And if I don't accept every part of this, then I am accursed. Mark 16, 17 says, And this sign shall follow those believing these things. In my name they will cast out demons. Acts 16, 18, Being distressed and turned into the demonic spirit, Paul said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her. My Bible says, Demons flee from the presence and name of Jesus Christ. Not the gallbladder of a fish. Works. Tobias 12, 9 says, For arms does deliver from death and shall purge away all sin. That's not biblical. Rebuke. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers. So can the apocryphal books and the Bible be in harmony? Yes or no? Of course not. Prayer for the dead, 2 Maccabees 12, 43, for he is not, not hoped that the slain should have risen again. It had been superfluous and in vain to pray for the dead. So all the pagan doctrines are right in there. The Bible says you walk in the light as he in his light, and we have fellowship in the blood of Jesus Christ, and there's no need to pray for the dead. The Vulgate, well, Pope Sixtus declared the Vulgate infallible, but Clement ordered 2,000 changes to be made. So much for infallibility in 1592. Let's have a look at the Vulgate, which is the only one that was really superb, they say. 
Now, our Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed, but the Douay version, which is Vulgate, All Scripture inspired of God is profitable. So some might not be. The Hebrews 11 verse 21 in our Bible says, Jacob worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. The Vulgate says, Jacob adored the top of his rod. That's relic worship. So now you can pray to a rod. Pathetic. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that wash their robes. That's translated from the Codex Vaticanus. J K King James Version says, Blessed are they that do his commandments. Big difference. Big difference. Trust your Bibles. Don't trust that. Then came the Counter-Reformation. Preterism, Futurism, Alcazar Ribera, 1585. The Antichrist was in the past. The Antichrist is coming in the future. 1678, this is the Counter-Reformation. Richard Simon, Roman Catholic theologian, Dr. Alexander Geddes, Roman Catholic, starts this doctrine disseminating the Bible. When they couldn't get rid of the Bible, they disseminated it. If you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? John 5, 46, 47. They start disseminating the books of Moses and the creation account. Well, if they didn't believe Moses, you cannot believe Christ either. Because Christ also said, when the flood came, it took them all away. In the 19th century, the Protestant world, starting with the Anglican priest Samuel R. Maitland, started accepting futurism. So the Anglican Church starts propagating futurism. And then, under an utterance of tongues, dispensationalism comes to life. Neufeld Ministry, July 1978. Dispensationalism is the teaching that God had dispen different dispensations at different times. It's the main Baptist teaching, for example. There was an age of innocence, an age of conscience, human government, promise, the age of law, when you were saved by keeping the law, the age of grace, now you can sin as much as your life and you're still saved, and then the kingdom, which deals with the Jews and doesn't deal with us at all. It's not the biblical doctrine. 1869, Pope Pius calls the Vatican I Council, and ultramontanism triumphs. So here, in 1869, all power is centered in one man. And the Bible says that the man of sin must be revealed. So the whole of Catholicism is centered in one man since 1869, well after the Reformation. In 1870, just the next year, this one man is elevated publicly to the position of God. He was always in that position prior to that, but not by public statement. So the dogma of infallibility is published. Now tell me something. Should Protestants now come closer to the papacy because of this or further away? Further away. And then the Pope issues his encyclical of errors and he denounces liberal theology Liberal theology, by the way, is that twisting of terms. Liberal theology is being liberated to believe what you want to believe. In other words, if you believe the Bible, then you are a liberal theologian. It's got nothing to do with the way we think of liberal. You must know their termination, their terminology. And then separation of church and state. Now let's have a look. More questions to your answers, Bonaventure Henwood. This is present day stuff. We're talking right now our time, not Middle Ages. The church cannot fall into error. The Pope is the center and guarantee of this unity and if it enjoys full authority in matters of faith and morals, then it follows that he too cannot lead the true church into error in matters concerning divine revelation. The Pope cannot make a mistake. There are occasions on which the Pope, in carrying out his responsibility as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, makes use of his supreme apostolic authority to state clearly that a particular teaching on faith and morals must be held by the whole church. Very interesting. For this reason, Vatican I insisted that when the Pope exercises his supreme teaching authority, he is protected from error by that same infallibility which Christ willed for his church. So, infallibility is alive and well and living in Rome today. 
Now if the Pope is infallible and everything that's ever been said is ex cathedra, infallible, then everything stands. That's why they cannot rescind the doctrine. Now what did Pope Boniface VIII in his Bull Unam Sanctum state? He said, The Roman Pontiff judges all men, but is judged by no one. We declare, assert, define and pronounce, they like doing that, repeating themselves like that, to be subject to the Roman Pontiff is to every creature altogether necessary for salvation. That which was spoken of Christ, thou hast subdued all things under his feet, may well seem verified of me. I have the authority of the King of Kings, I am all and above all, so that God himself and I, the Vicar of God, have but one consistency, and I am able to do all that God can do. What therefore can you make of me but God? That's a Pope speaking. Well, Protestantism should have nothing to do with the system. It's wicked. Now, I was deceived myself, remember? I was Roman Catholic. I didn't know. Time magazine, May 25, 1981, when the Pope was shot, says, it's like shooting God. What are they saying? Don't let anyone deceive you in any way until the rebellion occurs. That day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Did we just see the Pope do that, yes or no? Yes, yeah, sure we did. So there it's all in the Bible. Do you know what? They cannot get rid of the Bible, and that is my proof and my guarantee that God is in control. By 1948, in spite of getting worse, not better, the World Council of Churches is formed, embracing most Protestant churches. By 1950, the Pope defines the bodily assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Wow! Things should get worse between the two groups, yes or no? No, they don't, they get better. 1958, the World Council of Churches and the International Missionary Council join up. By 1961, the Pentecostals are in there meeting in councils. By 1962, Pope John Paul calls the Vatican II Council and the Protestant churches say, oh, the Vatican has changed. They now say, we are separated brethren, we can believe what we want to believe, and uh, everything's honky-dory. What a big lie! What a big lie! They say that Rome has changed. Rome hasn't changed, let me show you that. So. The Vatican II, not a single doctrinal position of the Roman Catholic Church was revoked. Not one. This Pope, John XXIII, there he was carried into the council, and after that council, this man was put in control of the new doctrine, which was to go out to all the teaching institutions in the world. This is Karl Rahner, the Jesuit theologian, who was to teach that henceforth you could remain whatever you were, a Methodist, a Baptist, or whatever, you would be considered as authentic and an authentic Christian system provided one little thing. What do you think that was? That you had to be subject to the Pope, because remember, to be saved, it is absolutely essential that you be subject to the Bishop of Rome. Now, this book, no other name, is being propagated and used in all the theological seminaries of the entire world. And who is the author? His name is Paul Netter. Well, who did he study under? Paul Netter served as Divine Word Missionary before assuming position at Xavier University, Cincinnati, where he is presently Professor of Theology. He received this licentiate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome and studied under Karl Rana. So he studied under the Jesuit, Karl Rana. And what does he teach? Interesting, his symbol over there is that of Divine Man. Paul Netto faces the conundrum um, in Christianity, and now listen to this. Christianity believers, does theologic, 
Thus, theologically, in the face of growing evidence, scholarly and from personal encounter, that there are other ways, religious ways, of leading a full, authentic human life than the Christian way. Can a person be saved that is come to live a truly... What, what, just, just, just Shake your heads. Are you awake? Let's, let's, let's read that again. Can a person be saved that is come to live a truly human life? Is that the definition of being saved? No, no, no. That's a new definition. That's a new definition. By some other name than that of Jesus Christ? Let us answer is one can be saved by some other name. And then he proceeds to show how this affirmation can be squared theologically with full Christian commitment. This is first-rate creative theology. I agree with that, but it's not biblical theology, it's rubbish. Amen. So, being saved gets a new definition, and the new word is you can be saved by any name. It doesn't have to be Jesus, it can be Buddha, it can be Krishna, it can be Deta, it can be Muhammad, it can be you, whoever you like. That's the new theology. Then Rome's ecumenical concept. The unity of all Christians may be restored to shine forth for all peoples are called to a single people confessing one Jesus Savior. But now remember this Jesus is another Jesus because he has a totally different character. And Lord professing one faith celebrating one Eucharistic mystery. Can we celebrate one Eucharistic mystery? Yes or no? No we cannot. All Christians should be of an ecumenical mind, especially those entrusted with teaching. So, and it must be introduced into all institutions of advanced learning. So the Jesuits go into all institutions of advanced learning. Now let's ask the Catechism of the Catholic Church whether Rome changed at Vatican II. Is it true that you can be saved through another church? or that there are all kinds of churches called by God? Well, Article 816 of the Catechism says, The sole Church of Christ is that which our Savior after His resurrection entrusted to Peter's care, commissioning him and other apostles to extend and rule it. The Church constituted and organized as a society in the present world subsists in the Catholic Church which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops. The Second Vatican Council Decree on Ecumenism explains, for it is through Christ's Catholic Church alone which is the universal help towards salvation that the fullness of the means of salvation can be obtained. Has Rome changed? Yes or no? no. Then why does the Protestant world teach that they changed at Vatican II? They're saying exactly the same thing they said before. Exactly the same. Wounds to unity. In fact, this one and only Church of God, from its very beginning, there arose certain rifts which the Apostles strongly censured. Where there are sins, there are divisions and schisms and heresies. So those who separated from Rome, according to this definition, were doing what? Sinning. Aha! So Protestants are sinners. Is that what the Catechism teaches? Yes or no? That's what it says. That's what it says, whether we like it or not. Towards unity. Article 820, Catechism. Christ bestowed unity on His Church from the beginning. This unity, we believe, subsists in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose. So has Rome changed? Yes or no? So if you are a Protestant, and you are hearing that Rome has changed, and that all religions are accepted by Rome as equal partners, forget it! They're misinforming you. Here, everybody has to be subject to the supreme pontiff and the bishops. Priest J. Cornell, the final object of ecumenism, as Catholics conceive it, is unity in the faith, worship, and the acknowledgement of the supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. That's it. Now if you become subject to the Bishop of Rome, who do you subject yourself to? You are subjecting yourself to the one where the Bible says the dragon gave him his seat and his power and great authority. You are subject to Lucifer. Muslims, according to the Catechism, other religions, all nations form but one community. Let's go to Bonaventure Henwood. He's the spokesman. 
He says, Vatican II teaches in several places that the Catholic Church and it alone is the church founded by Jesus Christ. Rome has not changed. The doctrine that is taught in the Protestant churches has changed, not Rome. Now, let's go to our time. September 5, 2000. Churches examine Vatican's statement. Churches examine the statement, the Vatican statement on other churches' defects won't end religious dialogue. Vatican is so arrogant, they do nothing without premeditating it. So they say, it's time to announce that only we are the greatest. Wow! The very principle of dialogue requires that you have an authentic representative of your own tradition. And they issue a document, this is Rome, called Dominus Iesus, and they say, other churches are no sisters of ours, the Vatican insists. September 5, 2000. The Independent. It must be always clear that the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Universal Church is not the sister but the mother of all the churches. Cardinal Ratzinger, 9-4-2000. Have we got it now? Now when the Bible says the children return to the mother, is that good news or bad news? That's bad news. Source Center shots at Rome. The reaction of the ominous Jesus, churches are stunned by Pope's attack. Protestant church leaders express disappointment, BBC. Archbishop of Canterbury rebukes the Roman Catholic Church. Other churches are not the true faith, says the Vatican, CNN, and so it carries on. Jeffrey Smith, Washington Post, Foreign Service, he writes, A new Vatican dictum issued today declares that individuals can attain full salvation from earthly sin only through the spiritual grace of the Catholic Church and that other faiths, including Protestant Christian ones, have defects that place their followers in a gravely deficient situation in seeking salvation. The goal, according to the top Vatican official, is to combat the so-called theology of religious pluralism, which suggests that Catholics are on a par in God's eyes with, say, Jews, Muslims, or Hindus. So of all the religions in the world, which one is Mama, top dog? The Roman Catholic Church, and every single religion in the world must be subject to Rome, and then you will have the confederacy of Lucifer on the planet. That's what the Bible teaches, and what Rome is working for. Now how do you achieve that? Any effort to be made to make Sunday a day of rest, that was Vatican II as well. So Sunday must become the primordial feast where they celebrate the Paschal mystery. This is this mystery of the victory of Lucifer over Christ, the Eucharist. Terrible thoughts. Freedom from work. Other celebrations shall not have precedence over Sunday. They're going to make Sunday so prominent you will not know what hit you. And the supreme manifestation is the Sunday Assembly. That was Vatican II document. The Lord's Day. What is the catechism of the Catholic Church teaches? Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. That's Article 2174. But they tell you what it was. They say, we all gather on the day of the sun, for it is the first day. You can get everything out of the Catholic catechism. It's beautiful. I love this book. In Christ's Passover, Sunday fulfills the spiritual truth of the Jewish Sabbath and announces man eternal rest in God. Tradition preserves the memory of the ever-timely exhortation. You get everything out of the Catholic Church. Everything. They tell you. Why? They're proud of it. We've crushed him. We've crushed him, they say. Now, musical celebration. If you want people to forget about the Bible, and what it teaches, then let's ch change church into a party. Then you don't have to think about it. So let's have some musical celebrations. And uh, participation should be varied as much as possible until there is one fold and one shepherd. But they tell you who the shepherd must be. Who must it be? Must be the Pope. Vatican II document. Music, popular religious songs, instruments of the particular people. The participation should be internal but must also be external. 
That is to show an internal participation, gestures, bodily attitudes, acclamations, responses, singing. So we must get a lively church. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, and la 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 da da, and who name it. And let's get going. I have nothing against music. I love music. And I'm sure the courts of heaven love music. But if music takes the place, of worshipping God in spirit and in truth, then there's a problem. Yes. Now look at this. What must music be like? This is the Roman Catholic Catechism. The more emotional, the better. How I wept, deeply moved by your hymns, songs and voices that echoed through the church. What emotion I experienced in them. Those sounds flowed into my ears, distilled the truth in my heart. A feeling of devotion surged within me. Tears streamed down my face. Tears that did me good. If they can get emotion to take the place of your mind, they've won. Beware of so much emotion. Any music will do. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you, says Rome. The Pope, nudging 80, goes pop with an ABBA CD. Ta -da 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 -da. Pope goes crazy. This is the Pope's band that appeared with him on many, many stage performances. They will get the top rock band in a particular country to perform on their behalf, wherever they are. Here in your country, they got DC Talk, and here in Rome, they get the top rock band of, uh, of Italy to perform. Jesus Christ being crucified on a guitar, bass trap, arts theatre. By 1967, the faculty and students of the Catholic to Kesme University prayed for an outpouring of the Spirit and received it, and the charismatic movement in the Catholic Church was born. By 1968, the World Council of Churches came together, Catholic observers were there. Remember, Rome is never a member of the ecumenical movement because she's the mama. The children have to come to her, she doesn't have to go to the children. By 1975, things started happening. The Pope started speaking in tongues. Paul VI praised the spiritual renewal and Christianity Today, June 6, 1975, writes this about his speech. Bishops, archbishops, cardinals struggling to keep their hats in place, sang and danced in ecstasy, embracing one another, raising their arms to heaven, and Pope Paul VI address was punctuated with ecstatics. The Pope becomes a tongue-speaking Pope. Question. If tongue-speaking is something that even the Pope did, is it something that you would really seek to receive? No. The Lutheran Church by 1974 held communal masses with Rome. They're coming together, not in truth but in error. And then it published its papal primacy and the universal church. Lutherans start acknowledging the Pope as primate. Congregational, Presbyterian, Methodist, these churches are negotiating reunification with the Anglican Church and the latter with Rome. Colin Buchanan writes, the emergence of the Church of Rome as partner in ecumenical discussions, the impact of the charismatic movement has totally changed ecumenical relationships. So this movement of this very lively form of church worship has obliterated the doctrinal differences in Catholic speaking tongues and non-Catholic speaking tongues and Muslim speaking tongues and Hindus frequently speak in tongues and shamans speak in tongues and witch doctors speak in tongues. It's a normal thing in pagan religions. Here they all come together and they form one, but not one in truth. By 1975 they issue a common catechism, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestants, and they decry the Decalogue, they say many of the statements in this in the Bible were put in the mouth of Jesus, things that Jesus never said. They question his physical resurrection, just like they're doing now. And by 1977, the Anglican Church says, it seems appropriate that in any future union, a universal primacy, as has been described, must be held by the Roman See. So the Pope must be the primate. By 1989, they're ready to sign Runcie travels to Rome, he negotiates with the Archbishop, and then they sign the document. The Pope 
is head of the Anglican Church. They give the Masonic signal, hands across the seas. The rift between Protestantism and Catholicism is over. The Queen stands for the same system. The man in black meets the man in white. The Queen visits the Pope dressed in black, the color of repentance, and all become one. And Rome marches through the streets of the British Isles proclaiming the soil as hers. The next bishop to take over from Runcie is Carey, and he's a tongue speaker. There, practices speaking in tongues and other gifts of the Holy Spirit. Rome would bound, and there you have the new, what is that? The new St. Paul's. Very interesting place. Look at it. This is St. Paul's Cathedral. It never used to look like that. It looks like that now. You see, it's been remodeled. Oh, that's very interesting. It has a dome just like the Vatican. It has a triangle just like the Vatican. In fact, it looks like the Vatican. That's what it looked like before. That's the model of what it looked like before. And now it looks like that. You see, the Anglican Church has become a subsidiary of the Vatican. It is the Vatican. So the Church has changed. What is there inside? Pagan gods? If you look down the aisle, you have the black and white squares, and ooh, what is that? Benini's canopy, the Roman Catholics and Peter's canopy, altar, duplicated there in the Protestant church, and look up at the ceiling, and what do you see? Wow! The sign of Freemasonry. Very interesting. And sun worship on the floor. Solar pagan sun worship practiced in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Protestantism returns to the prostitute mother and adopts the religion of Lucifer. The people don't know it. Many of them are worshipping according to their best conscience, but the system knows exactly what they're doing. On the floor of the cathedral, you'll have the Druidish symbols of witchcraft. And you'll have the symbols, those are my feet by the way, I don't know why I got those in the picture, of sun, moon, and star worship. Interesting, isn't it? Then you have the symbols of Lucifer on the floor, the symbols of pagan peacock worship with the triangle, the all-seeing eye of, of uh, Lucifer within the circle of his divinity. You have the hexagram, you have the cross, you have the red dot, everything is there, plus you have the dead bodies underneath, and you have the new regalia, the symbols of the sun, Isis, Horus, Sep, on the cloaks of Protestantism. And used for the Mass, you worship Isis, Horus, Sep. Interesting. The symbol of the giving of the flesh, same as in Catholicism, Pope John the 23rd was moved by God to summon the council, said the present Pope. He says, by the year 2000 we must be more united. So, Ndugani talks on meeting the Pope. For unity all churches must accept papal authority. 1995, all churches. And the Bible says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. That means obey him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8, choose thee this day. If we go to Rome, we become subject to Rome, and we will be blotted out of the book of life. Well, we have a hard choice to make. A very hard choice to make. I was disgusted when I went to Germany and walked into the Dom zu Berlin, which is the top Lutheran church, the mother church of the Lutheran church. And there I found the Catholic candles and this picture. And who was on it? Mary, being venerated. Then Weltbild showed the picture of Martin Luther shaking hands with the Pope. And the Pope went in 1980 and visited uh, Germany and he prayed for unity. Ecumenism is an urgent task. 
Christians forging a new era, churches packed, Episcopals, Lutherans, and then heiße Eisen alte Zöpfe. Der Papst darf nicht mehr Antichrist sein. Der Papst soll nicht mehr Antichrist genannt werden. So, the Council of the Lutheran Church decides officially the Pope is no longer the Antichrist. Interesting. Interesting. And what happens then? Half a millennium rift comes together. Lutherans and Catholic reach agreements on issues that once split them. Churches end 500 year rift. And then I nearly died of a heart attack. Germany calls to ask forgive Luther. Hello. End of the Reformation. They come together. And here you have the, Af the African, the, the church in the main church in South Africa. This man was assassinated, by the way. This is the NG church, the Dutch Reformed church, which is the same as the Presbyterian church. It's exactly the same. It's Calvinism. They decide to follow Rome. And this church is fascinating because on this side the Protestants meet, they, join, they have the same steeple, and on that side the Catholic meets. One big happy family. Masonic icon to tour Algoma, Praying in front of an icon is, a, icon is akin to having a direct line to a saint. And the Knights of Columbus in the United States and in Canada send the icons to the churches and everyone is happy. Joint declaration of Lutherans and Catholics. And if you read that document, it's brilliantly written. And now you've got to get the minds of the people away from doctrine. And so, Theologen sollen lebendiger werden. Theologists want to become livelier. More party in the church, more swinging of the hands, more singing of the lyrics, more dancing, more doing whatever it takes except preach the word. And we'll walk together in unity. And what is it that's bringing about this unity? The charismatic movement is the best hope for renewal in the church. In the closing decades of the century, said Christianity the history of Christianity. And Professor Hollenweger, Birmingham, says, Already by bringing together Roman Catholics and Protestants, the charismatic movement has worked miracles. Now I have a question for you. And I want you to think carefully. If the charismatic movement is the glue that is gluing all the churches together, is it from God or is it from another source? And what's happening here in your state? The charismatic wave of unity amongst SA churches, Anglicans, Roman Catholics, suddenly there appeared an open door at which members from two different poles, the Pentecostals and the Orthodox churches, are finding a point of meeting. You see, if you join up as a consequence of liturgy, then you can all be one. If everybody is struck with speaking in tongues, well, same spirit. Happiness is. So, the time is more than ripe to look at what we have in common and not what divides us. Pastor Justice Duplessis was the first coordinator of all the charismatic churches in the world. And he was the leader of the charismatic churches. And he said, let's force better meetings with Rome. Terkatan said the same, Bayez Nodia said the same, Stanley Magoba said the same, and then we have the great movements of these annual get-togethers, spirit of tragic death, spirit of victims of tragic death. Chung Hyung Kung, theology professor, minister of the Presbyterian Church, South Korea, gave the second keynote address to the two-part theological introduction to the assembly theme. So this is the World Council of Churches coming together. This lady appears on the stage. She's dressed in white and she calls the spirit of the dead up. Hagar, Uriah, the babies killed by Herod, Joan of Arc, Jewish people killed, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and finally she calls the spirit of the liberator, Jesus Christ, from the dead as well. Wow! That's spiritism practiced by the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches Seventh Assembly held in Canberra, Australia, 1991. And the theme was, Come Holy Spirit, Renew the Whole Creation. And everything was paganistic. And remember now that Alice A. Bailey said that the Holy Spirit is whom in their system? 
to Lucifer. Why does the World Council of Churches give prominence to demon-like ancestor spirits? Oikomene, oikomene, all religions coming together. Oikomene, what does it mean? The word ecumenical, this is the World Roman Catholic, World Council of Churches webpage, the world word ecumenical is derived from the Greek term oikomene, which may be translated as the whole inhabited world. It is in seeing this world as gods that we see ourselves as one. It is in seeing all the world's people as made in God's image that we are called to protect the welfare of everyone. Now, according to Gary H. Carr on Route to Global Occupation, if you look at the ancient mystery religions and Kabbalism and Gnosticism and Knights Templars and Rosicrucians and Freemasonry, which I'll deal with in a future lecture, you will see that Marxism, American and European secret political societies, international banking and the World Council of Churches are part of the mystery religion. So that is why they are teaching error and lies. Bringing ancestors to a mass, no problem. By 1986, the Pope visits the synagogues. By 1987, he gets Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism and Judaism in line. By 1989, he goes into Russia. And here you have the Pope with all the religious systems of the world because he will be the future head of all the churches. Israeli chief rabbi prays for the Pope. Israel invites the Pope to visit the Holy Land. He makes right. He goes to Schindler's widow over here. This is the, the uh, rabbi Robert Jacobs, one of the prime people in Judaism. Let's see what he has to say about the Pope. So Judaism is happy with this Pope. And when the Pope came to this country, this man was the spokesman. If you thought Kabbalism was not subject to the Pope, I have news for you. Here's Alexei. He is the Patriarch of Moscow. The widely traveled Alexa is a committed ecumenist. So the Orthodox Church comes together with Cardinal Cassidy, head of the Council for the Advancement of, Church, of Unity of the Churches by 1994, and the Orthodox Church receives its freedom to practice. And the Patriarch and the Pope meet publicly, the one subject to the other, revival old church, new outlook. So we have a total new religious experience. Occultism, Asian religions, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Sakagaya, all of them. They are great expectation. The spokesman and the archbishop and the patriarch of the Orthodox Church subjects himself to Rome. Islam, opening Islamic cultural center in Rome, Catholic bishops presided. Pope John Paul greeted the event as a clear sign of religious freedom. Look at this man here, together with the Pope, Yasser Arafat. And here in Jerusalem recently, this is a signal picture. The Mother Church and the two obtrusive little, obnoxious little children that constantly fight each other. Islam and Judaism. And the mother says, tut, 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 when will you learn? If necessary, out of chaos, they will have to learn. And they will be subject to Rome. These are 
figures here that are all based on paganism. Every single one of these kalants and, and uh, structures are based on paganism, but they're all from the Catholic Academism, Catholic Seminar. There you have the unity of all the churches around the central star, which represents the dog star, which represents Sirius, which represents Lucifer. And there you have the dog star shining on the nations. There's the Kalant, you can see the symbol, it's a pagan symbol. There's the Mandala, the Catholic Church used them both. They are the high priests of occultism. The Pope and the Dalai Lama, what about the great Protestant teachers of this world? What about people like Billy Graham? What does he have to say? When you went into the ministry, politics lost one of its potentially greatest practitioners. He's been a pre friend of presidents all along. Interesting signals he's making. We'll see about them later. Here he is in Madison Square Garden. And here he is speaking in the rotunda of the United States. States Capitol during the presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal to Ruth and me. He receives a medal from Catholicism. On receiving an honorary doctrine from, doctorate from the Roman Catholic Belmont College, Billy Graham said that the gospel that founded this college is the same gospel which I preach today. Isn't that interesting? So he's preaching Catholicism. The religious news services reported January 13, 1981, Pope John Paul II was closeted for almost two hours with the Reverend Billy Graham, the world's best known Protestant evangelist. The religious news service reported this, there he goes, and the Pope is almost an evangelist. God told me December 1991 that he was going to bless the Christian coalition, that was Pat Robertson, beyond the wild streams. Christian coalition, presidents of the United States, even present ones, very interesting. And the evangelicals and the Catholics join forces. And the president calls the Pope a superstar. President George W. Bush praises Pope John Paul II and promises to defend the unborn child. And then after cutting the ribbon in, uh, at this foundation, which houses the Vatican, what did he say? He said, now listen to this, this is March 28, 2001, Washington. President George W. Bush visited Catholic University, American in Northwestern Washington, with a salute to John Paul II and a plea to defend and love the, the child waiting to be born. The best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teachings seriously, to listen to his words, and put his words and teachings into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. On the website National Review Online, it was written, President Bush seems to be doing everything possible to emulate John F. Kennedy. He's not just cutting taxes, he's becoming Americans' second Catholic president. They said that in his remarks he began to sound like the pontiff himself. Very interesting. And then you have September 11th. Wow, what happened? He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. If you don't listen to the system, you're in trouble. And after September 11, all the religions came together, all the religions, whether it was Islam, Protestantism, Catholicism, all came together in great ecumenical movements. And do you know that in 1997 already, the Episcopal Church said the following. Unbelievable stuff. They said, the main difference between Protestant faith and Catholicism is episcopy, that is succession of the apostles. Adler, who is the bishop, said that after the sermon he stood up to give a prophetic word but fell on the floor and wept for 45 minutes. That's typically charismatic. Then he said, we all sensed what God was saying to us. We were witnessing the end of Protestantism. God's church is Catholic, he declared. It was Catholic in the beginning and it will be Catholic in the end. Very interesting. And then June 1999, churches agree Pope has overall authority. If you thought this was future, then I have news for you. It's done. It's a done deal. 
The Pope was recognized as the overall authority in the Christian world by an Anglican Roman Catholic Commission yesterday, which described him as a gift to be received by all the churches. Very interesting. What else did they decide? The gift of authority has been produced by the 18-member Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission of the five years. The Commission concluded that the Bishop of Rome had a specific ministry concerning the discernment of truth and accepted that only the Pope had the moral authority to unite the various Christian denominations. Aha! So he's still infallible. Wonderful stuff. Churches should hold seances. 2,000. Parishes in the Church of England will next month be urged to hold Christian seances. We've gone full circle. Protestantism has become spiritism. Did you know that? This is not some mild little thing that's happening. The Roman Catholic controversy, this is James R. White, Catholic and Protestants. Here's a man who writes recently and still calls a spade a spade to check the unbridled spirit it decrees that no one relying on his own judgment shall in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine be able to make his own decisions. That's Council of Trent. The Pope is going to decide everything. This Pope is more conservative than any of those before him. Although they appeared liberal, they really weren't. But he wrote a document, The Refinement of Evil, in which all the pagan doctrines are reasserted. And this man, Karl Rana, is the keeper of the straight and narrow. Do you know that he belongs to an organization called the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith? Now this man, Karl Rana, is the cardinal presiding over the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith. It's in the same building. The name, the original name has been removed and that name put there, but it's the same organization. Guess what it's called, or what it was called? It was called the Inquisition. So, I have news for you. The Inquisition is alive and well, living in Rome, and the chief man is Cardinal Ratzinger. Now the church has come together and Freemasonry is doing it. By 1986 we had the Council of Assisi, all the religions of the world, joining up. Every single one, from the Dalai Lama to Islam to Buddhism, the works, every single one was there, including Protestantism and the Orthodox Church, and the man in white was the spokesman of the religions. We've read this one already in the previous lecture on the New Age, so I'm not going to repeat it. The United Nations, this happened, of course, August 2000. All the religions of the world came together and decided to unite on their points. The United Nations of Faith, the ecumenical initiative that was funded by Ted Turner. 2,000 representatives of very well or less known religions, the ones which are practiced the world over, or which are almost an affair of confidence, only known in the corridors of the United Nations. The Pope sent the African Cardinal Francis Arsene, President of the Pontifical Council for Interfaith Dialogue, representing the Jewish faith, was Rabbi Lowe of Jerusalem, Buddhists, Everybody was represented. Best Desmond, Desmond Tutu said this is the greatest thing in the United States and in particular in circles of the new and this first initiative has been welcomed. Nevertheless one needs to render the, to Caesar or rather to John Paul II his Jews. Isn't that interesting stuff? Wow! It is indeed thanks to him that the way of reconciliation was started in Assisi 1985. Since that date, every year, they have been meeting and they've been calling it the Parliament of World Religions. And then in 2001, he visited Damascus and he went to the Muslims and he went to that Umayyad Mosque, there it is, where the head of John the Baptist is located. And this is where the Pope asked for reconciliation with Islam. Interesting, because the religion is basically the exact same religion that was there all this time. Let's wait for this picture to change. That is what the mosque looks like inside. It is a memorable place to be, really quite stunning. Move. There's a man praying with his mantra and uh, the repetitive prayers, 
the, over and over, it's exactly the same of Catholicism. You thought Islam and Catholicism were something different? Exactly the same. There was the place where John the Baptist's head is kept. Islam and Catholicism behind the scenes are one and the same religion. They serve the same self, self same God. And there you have it, only the men over there, the outer court. Listen to this little video over here. This is the sound of the Umayyad Mosque. Listen, look at the mantra praying. It's exactly the same as you have in Catholicism. It's sad. It makes me very, very sad. I would love to reach out to these people. I really would love to reach out to them. What do you make of this? The Pope kisses the Quran after an audience with the Patriarch Raphael I of Iraq. You see, the Pope is the leader, the central leader, and he is all things to all men. There is the unity, as we will have it in the new religious system, and we'll have Judaism and Buddhism and Christianity and Islam and Hinduism surrounding each other. This is the great ecumenical movement. This is the Lehman page for the World Peace Day. We have a parliament of world religions. We have a central solar worship emblem, and we have the flames all the way around it. Sun worship the worship is going to be the worship of all the world. Here is a video what happened a subsequent Assisi event of the Pope in Rome with all the religious leaders of the world of every single religion under the sun bowing down to the Pope. And the rock band in the background is Italy's number one rock band. Three candles, masonry. This is at the Vatican. There's the Dalai Lama with his sun candle. And now the religions come and bow down to the Pope. There's the Dalai Lama, Eastern religions. Notice the stars, Islam, all of them. <laughs> Japanese Buddhism. What do you make of that? The Bible says the children will return to the mother. Have they, yes or no? Yes. Is there long before we're going home? No. I don't think so. All the religious systems are united. It's a done deal. The little ripples you see out there are nothing. The central core has done its work. The Spiegel published this one. It's actually quite fascinating. There you had the Caesar and there you had Mussolini with a finger in the air. That's a Masonic symbol. The Pope was there with the full ritualistic dress of the high priest of sun worship. And with him, they have this woman. They don't even have fear to show who and what they are. They know that they are the prostitute of revelation and they are proud of it. They are proud of it because they believe that their master, Lucifer, is the victor. That's why they don't have a problem with it. 
And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 18. Now I've only shown you the religions, I haven't shown you the kings of the earth yet. That's still coming. And I had another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. If your institution is joining up with Rome, then come out of her, my people, because you would become subject to the Bishop of Rome and would become subject to the reign of Lucifer. The Bible says, separate yourselves. We can see the children have returned. Time is no more. The Maitreya is ready to come. Satan is ready to counterfeit the coming of Christ. The religions of the world are united. We need perhaps one final conflagration, one final chaos to get everyone to accept unity. God help us. But I'm confident because the Lord has predicted all these things and He has given us the, out, the, the way out. He has told us the way it will happen and He has told us your bread and your water will be sure and you are the apple of His eye. Not one hair will be bent. We have nothing to fear. It's exciting the time we are living in. I'm not giving these lectures to make you afraid. I'm giving you these lectures to show you that it's time to wake up. Amen. And to say, Lord, come. I cannot wait for this deception and this lie to end. But we must open our mouths that the people out there can know the truth and come out too. Why should we be selfish and want to go alone to heaven? God help us. Thank you for coming. May the Lord bless you.